Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Phil, could you come up here and center this podium? And then we're going to start over. Because I like to have the podium in the center. And so do the camera people, by the way. All right. Thank you, thank you. Now, you know, you know something's not right. You ever walk into a, an office, a doctor's office or something, and, and you're in the waiting room and you see a picture that's not straight? Oh, that happens to me all the time. And I always kind of like go over like I'm acting up, like I'm going to the coffee pot, straighten that picture up, you know. <laughs> Just something about it. It's kind of a mental thing, but uh, you guys all knew that about me anyway. Praise the Lord. Are you ready to get in the Word again? All right. Lift up the Word and repeat after me. I believe this is the Word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Last week we started talking about demon spirits, and in the teaching of demon spirits on a scale of 1 to 10, we got up to about one and a half. And uh, I think we need to continue on just a little bit on this. We need to understand something, and that is this, that more than anything in the teaching of demon spirits, we need to understand that we have been given authority over all the power of the enemy. You cannot allow this teaching to scare you. I've been in churches where uh, preachers have preached on hell, like they had just gotten back. And, you know, you could, their hair was on fire. And, and sometimes that's really good as long as they tell you how you don't have to go there. But we need to understand when it comes to demonic spirits, you do not have to be under the influence of demons. The Bible tells us that many things that we think are happening naturally are actually caused by evil spirits. When Jesus went from town to town and village to village, it says he healed all who were sick and oppressed by the devil. You'll find several times, and we could if we have time in these next few weeks, maybe, uh, talk about this. But many times when Jesus would heal someone, the spirit, the evil spirit, would go out of them. Many times... Jesus would command a spirit to go, and the person was just healed. Last week, we talked about the demoniac of the Gadarenes. When the evil spirits, and how many were there? There were at least 2,000, because they went into 2,000 pigs. When these spirits went out of the man, he changed from a man who was running through the cemetery at night terrorizing people, and he was running naked, and he was so strong, he was so strong that they put chains on him. They chained him down, and he would, he would break the chains. He changed from that when the spirits left to a man that was in his right mind, completely clothed, and sitting down talking with Jesus. Now, that's... That's the conversion that God wants for us. <clears throat> now, the group that I speak to most of the time is people like you. Who are you? Well, you are born-again believers. 99% of the people I speak to are born-again believers. We must understand this, that as a born-again believer, you are a spirit you have a soul, which is your mind, your will, your intellect, and your emotions, and you live in a body. Where the Spirit of God lives, demonic spirits cannot live. As a born-again believer, you cannot be possessed by the devil. Now, the people during the time of Jesus could be possessed by the devil because no one at that time was born again. We are a very unique group. We are the church. We are a group of people who have been blessed with grace 
so that if we decide that we want to believe in Jesus, we don't have to do anything other than receive it. And when we receive this gift of everlasting life, the Holy Spirit moves inside of us. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. Thus, the Holy Spirit is God. Jesus said, God is light, and in him is no darkness whatsoever. We are told that in John. We are also told that we are the light of the world as believers. We are the light of the world. So you don't have to be concerned about a demon possessing you. That's the worst state possible because you're a believer. A demon cannot possess you. However, you are a three-part being, your spirit, soul, and body. And a demonic spirit can torment your body and can torment your soul. There are people who have lost their mind or who are Christians, and they've lost their minds because they've allowed demonic spirits to control their thinking. But we must understand this. As Christians, this is why we need to know this. We have authority over all the power of the enemy. And we need to use that authority. It, it's kind of like having a gun with bullets. And a thief comes into your house and he tries to murder you and your family. The gun is only profitable if you know what the bullets do, how to load it, and how to use it. I mean, you could literally be killed in your house along with your family and have, have a gun laying on the table and you couldn't protect yourself because you didn't know how to use it. Well, see, that's the way the authority is. As believers, we need to know how to activate the authority over the demonic spirits so that we don't get tormented by them. Now, keep this in mind. Not everyone is a born-again believer. People who are not born-again believers do not have the Spirit of God living inside of them. And even in, during this day and age, they can be demon-possessed. Do we ever run into demon possession? Yes, we do. Many times, I, I shouldn't say many times, several times, Loretta and I have encountered demonic spirits. Only once in my life have I seen one. And that took place on stage at this church when we were meeting across the street at the theater. People were coming up for prayer. Because of the way that theater is laid out, we did all the prayer ministry on the stage. People were coming up for prayer, and the usher was bringing them over one by one, and I was laying hands on them. We had a doctor in the community, an MD in the community, and she was waiting over there for me to pray for her. After I prayed for this one person, <clears throat> excuse me, after I prayed for this one person and they, they walked off, I turned and when I looked at the doctor, about this far to the right of the doctor, I saw with my eyes, not, not, not a dream, not, it wasn't one of those things where you've got your eyes kind of halfway closed and the capillaries and the light shining and you're kind of squiggly trying to figure out things like looking at the clouds on a Saturday. It wasn't that type of thing. It, it was a real clear vision and I saw a demonic spirit it looked like a, a Great Dane dog. It was slimy. It was kind of army green colored. And it was, it was slimy. And excuse the term, it just looked snotty. And <clears throat> it, was, it, was as, it wasn't dripping off of it, but it was as though it could. And it was setting up like that, two long forward feet. And it was just sitting there. And at the time, you know, I, I kind of forgot that the doctor was standing over there. And I looked over to that side of the stage and I said, I, something along the line of, I curse you and I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, be gone. And this demonic spirit that I could see, nobody else could see it evidently, leaped off the stage and loped to the back of the auditorium. I watched it go out the back of the auditorium. Now somebody may say, what, you're just making that up. 
See, I knew you would say that. <clears throat> but I was not just making it up. Now, what's funny is the doctor thought that I was talking to her. You know, I rebuke you. And <laughs> you know, she's over there going, what in the world is, what did I do, you know? So that answered a question for me personally. Is it possible to see demons? Well, now I know the answer is yes, they can be. But it has to be that God opens your eyes so that you can see into the spirit realm. Much like the prophet when he had his assistant with him and they were surrounded by the Syrian army and the assistant was going, oh boy, we're in trouble here. We're in trouble here. Sounded like that, what's that dog's name on Winnie the Pooh? We're in trouble here. It's really looking bad, you know? <laughs> And it's going to get worse. <laughs> but the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the assistant to the prophet was, was there and, and said, boy, this, this doesn't look so good. And the prophet said, Lord, open his eyes so he can see. And the Lord opened his eyes and he saw into the spirit realm and he saw the army of the Lord all around them in camp. Ready for battle. Wow. See, we need to understand that the army of the Lord is encamped around us and ready for battle. But they will not go into battle until we send them into battle. You know, Psalm 103, verse 20, says that angels are standing by waiting to hear the voice of God's Word so that they can do it. Right here, bless the Lord, you His angels, who excel in strength, who do His Word. What do angels do? They do His Word. Heeding, that means they hear and they act on, the voice of His Word. Well, who is going to speak His Word in your life? It's you. Who's going to speak God's Word over your circumstance. It's you. You are the body of Christ. You Look, Jesus, and, and I say this respectfully, Lord, but Jesus technically is not here. The Father is technically not here. Now, we know he's omnipresent. He can be everywhere. But he's omnipresent by way of the third part of his being, the Holy Spirit. So, when, remember when Stephen was stoned, and that doesn't mean he was in Colorado on weed. Now, when Stephen, when, when Stephen was stoned and they were, they were throwing stones at him trying to kill him, you thought that was funny, huh? <laughs> when they were trying to kill him, the Scripture says he looked up into heaven and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. When Jesus told us to pray, he said, pray this way, our Father who art in New York City. No. Our Father who, who art at the Lake of the Ozarks. No. He said, our Father who art in heaven. So we can find all through Scripture, it says that Jesus, when he ascended, he took his place at the right hand of the Father, seated on high. So the Father and Jesus are in heaven. But God is here on the earth in the form of his Spirit, that lives in us, that makes us the body of Christ. And if his word is going to be spoken so that the angels can hear it and do it, it has to be spoken through our lips. That's what I'm getting at. We have to be the one to speak his word. We have to be the one that activates the forces. Well, the best way to defeat your enemy in some ways is to know about your enemy. And this is why that we have embarked on this study of demon spirits. You know, Paul said this. He said that I would not, this, the way we would say it, he said, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning the devices of the devil. Why? If you know what the enemy's trying to do, you can prevent it. 
If you don't know that the enemy causes sickness and disease, you will never speak and prevent the enemy from bringing sickness and disease. Now, does that mean all sickness and disease is demonic? No, it does not. Sometimes it's just because it's natural, because of the natural failure of this earth right now. There are, some th there are, there are things going around in the air, and there are th some people don't take, take care of themselves. Listen, if all you do is drink Diet Coke and eat Hostess Twinkies, and that's it, it doesn't take a demon to get you sick. Death by Twinkie. So, we need to know where the devil came from. Well, some people just think that uh, he just has always been. No, the devil has not always been. God in his word, well, let's just take a look at some scriptures here. Um, first of all, we need to understand that science, science, and the Bible do not disagree. If, let's put it this way, true science and true Bible do not disagree. There's a lot of people teaching things in the Bible and there's a lot of people saying things about science that are not true. And if they're not true, they don't agree. But true science and true Bible agree. Now, let's take a look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. Verses 5, 6, and 7. For this they willingly forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in water, by which the world that, what, then existed, perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now are now preserved by the same word, and they are reserved for fire until the day. What day? The day of judgment. Now, what does that mean, the world that was? Was destroyed by water. There are some who teach that that's the flood of Noah. The world that was, there was a flood, and now we have the world that is. But what we need to understand is that the world before Noah, from Adam to Noah, is the same world we have now. There hasn't been a new earth created. There hasn't been new heavens. There hasn't been an upheaval. Because, now think about it this way. The animals that were put on the ark are the same animals we have now. The animals that got off the ark after the flood are the same animals that got on the ark before the flood. So it's not, that was not the world that it's referring to here in Peter. In other words, there was a flood before Noah's flood on this earth. When God said that he was no longer going to destroy the earth by water, he's referring to the two previous floods, not just the one. Let me give you some scripture. That always helps. <laughs> in the beginning, let's just go back to this. In the beginning, in Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens, that's plural, not heaven. He created the heavens, plural, and the earth. How many heavens did he create? Well, we know that according to Paul, there's at least three heavens. There's at least three. 
because he said he was caught up into the third heaven. And when he was in the third heaven, he saw the, he was taken to the paradise of God. He, he literally went to the paradise of God in heaven. Well, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they have recently uh, translated the book of Levi. Now, it's called the Testament of Levi, and a gentleman that I know in Kansas has headed up this translation, and, and uh, what this was is all of the patriarchs, when they got ready to pass, when they knew it was time for them to die, they would bring their family together, and they would give them a written history of what they knew. And they would bring their family together, and they would tell them what they knew, and it would be written down and preserved. And many of these patriarch notices were kept and down through the generations, and they were in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, when they translated the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the first thing that they translated was Scripture. Anything that was not Scripture, they set it aside. But anything that was canonized Scripture, they translated it first. Then, after the years went by, it takes a long time to translate all this stuff, then they started in on other documents. Well, the, the book of Levi is another document. <clears throat> Levi, when he brought his family together, he said there, God created seven heavens. Now, <clears throat> and, and he tells what was on each level of heaven. Of course, we, Paul and Levi both agreed that the first heaven is our atmosphere here on the earth. It goes up as high as the tallest mountain. It's the air that we breathe. That's heaven number one. And so, Paul said that there were three, and Levi said that there were seven, and somebody may say, well, who's this Levi guy anyway? Why should we believe him? Well, <clears throat> his dad was Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and the Levitical tribe came through him. So, his dad was Jacob. His grandpa was Isaac. His great-grandpa was Abraham. And God spoke personally to all of them. I would think this guy knew something. I would say <laughs> probably what he knew was, was not just hearsay. So what we need to understand is how great God's creation is. As we understand where the demons came from, we need to understand how great God's creation is. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I can show you several other scriptures that talks about a place other than the heavens and the earth. You know the scripture in Ephesians where it says that Jesus ascended after his resurrection? Everybody thinks about that scripture about how Jesus ascended into heaven. He descended, he who descended also ascended, and we just kind of read it, he ascended into heaven. That's not what the scripture says. You can look it up when you get home. It says he ascended far above all the heavens, whether there's three or seven or however many there are. He ascended above them. Well, the heavens are our universe. Wow. You mean there's something beyond the heavens? Well, according to the Scripture. And I can show you Scripture that tells us what is beyond the heavens. What's beyond the heavens? Beyond the heavens is filled with the glory of God. It says that two different places in the Bible. So what is the glory of God? It's the manifested presence of God. So think about this. Our universe is big. How big is it? Light traveling at 299 million meters a second. That's fast. What is that, 186,000 miles per second? Light traveling that far per second would take 93 billion years 
to travel from one side of the universe to the other side of the universe that science now can see. And so we say, well, you mean the heavens, the universe is 93 billion miles wide? No, that's just as far as we can see. And every time we get a new telescope, you know, like we, we had the Hubble in space, and now there's one that sees 100 times farther than the Hubble. We just keep seeing more. God's heavens are just huge. And then there's an area beyond that, which is the glory of God, which lets us know that the entire universe is encased in the glory of God. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. Let's all say this, Barashit, Bara, Elohim, Et, Hashemai, Ha Aretz. Yeah. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, let me ask you a question. How did he create them? Well, we can say mechanically he created them with his word. He spoke them into existence. But how were they when he created them? They were perfect. There was no flaw in them. Let's go to verse 2, Genesis 1, 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was what? Verse 2 now. The earth was without form and void. Now, now follow me on this. And darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, do you see that phrase there, without form and void? That comes from two Hebrew words, tohu vabohu. That means it was without form and void. It was chaotic. It was a mess. The earth was without form and void. Now, the first verse says God created the heavens and the earth. The second verse says the earth, and it actually means it became formless and void. Now, I can show you Scripture. For the sake of time, I just can't have you turn to all of them. But I can show you Scripture that says God did not create the earth Tohu vabohu. In vain, he did not create it formless and void. So if he did not create it formless and void, and it became formless and void, what caused it to become formless and void? Well, we must understand that there was more going on on this earth than what most people think. Science tells us that 13.8 billion years ago, there was a singularity that took place, and a spark happened smaller than an atom, and there was some type of mass explosion. They can't explain why, but they just say there was a mass explosion, and the universe came into existence. Many of the physicists believe that it was as much as 400 million years before there was any light of any kind, before there was any light. You say, well, that doesn't agree with the Bible because it says God created the heavens and the earth on day one. No, we haven't. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth became formless and void, and waters hovered over the face of the earth. Day one hadn't even got here yet. Day one hasn't come yet. So what happened between verse 1 and verse 2? In verse 1, the heavens and the earth were perfect. And, and in verse 2, the heaven around the earth and the earth was formless and void. And water, water encased the earth. That's the first flood. Water encased the earth. What happened? Well, what happened was, let's just take a, oh, by the way, this scripture is Isaiah 45, 18, that says, for thus says the Lord who created the heavens, 
who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain. That word vain there is tohu. He did not create it formless and void. Well, it's powerful, isn't it? Okay. Let's go to verse 3. Let's just go there. Then God said, let there be light. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and he called the light day and the darkness night, so that the evening and the morning were the first day. What did he create on the first day? Nothing. People say, wait a minute, time out. God, God created the, the, the sun and the, and the moon because it says God created light. No, the sun and the moon were not created until day four. They did not show up until day four. So when God said, let there be light, what, what's he referring to? What did we say God, God is? God is light. And in him is no darkness whatsoever. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Something happened, and the earth became formless and void, and there was a flood on the earth. And so then God shows up and says, I'm here. Let there be me. He didn't create himself. He just showed up. And that light separated, separated, not created, it separated. Separated what? Something that was already there. Okay. Do you guys still love me? You know, it's 50%. We're working on that. Genesis 1, 6. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the water. Let there be a heaven, let there be air in the midst of the water, and let us what? Divide the waters. Did he create the waters? No, he divided the waters from the waters. And so God made the firmament. He, how did he make it? By dividing the waters. Now, and God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. What did he create on the second day? Nothing. Nothing. What do you mean, nothing? The waters were already there. Remember, verse 2, and waters circled the earth. The earth was flooded. What did God do? He separated the waters from the waters, allowing there to be space, air, and land. Wow. So he didn't actually create. He separated what was already created. Boy, this, is, this gets fun. Verse 12. Well, let's, let's go back up to verse 9. Then God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and, he, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind. Have you ever seen this next line? Whose seed in itself is on the earth. One version of the Bible says, let the earth bring forth and multiply from the seed that's already there. He didn't create the seed. He just made it so that the seed could grow by separating and making dry land. Well, how did that seed get there? It was there in the world that was that somehow became chaotic. Okay. I'm going to get you back, I promise. Verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass and herb that yields according to its kind, and the tree that yields the fruit, whose seed is in itself 
according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. What did God create on the third day? Absolutely nothing. He separated the waters so that the seed that was already there could grow. Where did that seed come from? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Perfect. But something happened, and the earth became formless and void. What happened? How much time elapsed between verse 1 and verse 2? Could be millions of years. Could be billions. We'll see. All right. Turn to Isaiah 14, 12. And we're going to take a look at Lucifer here. One thing you need to understand about Lucifer is Lucifer is an angel. The Bible, nev the Bible never says Lucifer was an archangel. Many <clears throat> denominations and some ancient Catholic teachings and, and many stories, and you've got to be careful, you can't get your theology from Hollywood. You know, Clarence trying to earn his wings and all that kind of stuff, it just confuse you. But they, many of them will say that Lucifer was an archangel. Some of the ancient books refer to four archangels. But you need to understand this. The Bible calls Lucifer a cherub. Now, a cherub... Remember the Ark of the Covenant. There were two angelic structures with their wings out, and they call them cherubim. Well, that's, that's plural for cherub. So, Lucifer was created as an angel. Now, listen to this. Isaiah 14, 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How are you are cut down to the ground. That's the same Hebrew word for earth. You who weakened... You who weakened the nations. What nations? There were no nations between verse 1 and verse 2, were there? Well, people would say, of course not, because man hadn't been created. Well, there were civilizations before Adam and Eve. And if you'll understand this, this will help you understand how science and the Bible fit together. So somebody might say, you mean there were men on the earth before Adam and Eve? No, I didn't say that. There were no men on the earth before Adam and Eve because Adam was clearly the first man. The Bible tells us many times that Adam was the first man. Well, if there, was, if there were beings on the earth before Adam... And something happened in those civilizations to really get God upset, then what were they? Well, the Bible doesn't clear, clearly tell us, but there are multiple places, and I can show you many, many places, where it talks about when Lucifer was cast out of heaven, and he was cast out of heaven before Adam and Eve were ever put in the Garden of Eden. When he was cast out of heaven, he was cast down before the nations. Well, nations have boundaries. Nations have kings. Nations have commerce. Look at this. Isaiah 14, verse 13. For you, talking about Lucifer, have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also set on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. Hmm. Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. In other words, he's going to ascend above the first heaven. He's going on up there. I will be like the most high God. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the grave, to, to death, to the lowest parts of the pit. Those who see you 
will gaze at you and consider you saying, now here's what they're going to say after he's cast down. Is this the man, and that word can be translated being, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms? What kingdoms? Who made the world as a wilderness? How did it become as a wilderness? Tohu vabohu, it became formless and void. And destroyed its cities? Wow. So, something was going on on this earth. Now, have you ever noticed that science from time to time will discover something that they say is thousands of years old? And our Bible tells us that it's only been 6,000 years since Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden. See, the Bible doesn't tell us that it was 6,000 years from the time the world was created to now. It tells us that it was 6,000 years from the time Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden until now. But the Bible does not tell us how long they were in the Garden of Eden. And it does not tell us how long before the Garden of Eden, before they were placed there, it was after and God created the heavens and the earth. See, if you can understand this, this can help you understand some of these prehistoric discoveries. While uh, Robbie and I were on the island of Malta with, uh, with L.A. Marzulli and a film crew that was doing a uh, History Channel basic documentary, uh, is what it was going to be used for, on the island of Malta there are many, many structures that are just thousands of years old. In fact, what's interesting, it, I mean, this is an actual nation. Malta is a nation out in the middle of the Mediterranean. It was the most bombed place in World War II. Um, several popes had their castles there. The Knights Templar had many underground passages. And I told you about the place uh, where the hypogeum, where we went into underground tunnels, and they pulled over 30,000 skeletons out of these tunnels and many of them had the elongated heads. Uh, they weren't human. And uh, those were supposed to be there for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. Well, on one side of the island of the, the nation of Malta, which, by the way, is solid rock. Remember, Paul was shipwrecked there. There are two grooves. There's grooves about this deep and about this wide, and there's two of them approximately about eight foot apart. And they come up out of the water on one side of the nation. And these two grooves in solid rock go across the entire nation and back into the water in the Mediterranean on the other side. And they claim that they are at least eight to 12,000 years old. Well, if it's only been 6,000 years since Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, then how could, who made those things? Who made them? Well, see, if you can understand that there was a civilization before Adam and Eve, it'll help you understand this stuff. When you look at dinosaurs and, and all of the different types of creatures, see, they weren't put on the ark. Dinosaurs weren't put on the ark. So that must mean that the world before the flood didn't have them. Because if they'd had them, they'd been on the ark because God commanded Noah to put two of every kind on the ark. Or whatever. You know how the story goes. Well, look at this in Jeremiah chapter 4. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form. And void, and the heavens had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man. Okay, now, now follow me on this. There was no man. Man did not exist on the earth at this time. There was no man, and all the birds of the heaven had fled. That birds of the heaven and the Hebrew simply means flying creatures. 
So you go to a museum someplace and you see some skeleton of a flying creature with a 20-foot wingspan or, or more, and you try to figure out scientifically how that existed. The Bible tells us right there that there were creatures on the earth that were destroyed. They were, they'd all fled, and there was no man yet. Man had not been created yet. Well, who had been created? Who was here? Angels were here. Who were these civilizations on the earth? They could have been some other type of creature. They could have simply been other types of angels. The Bible tells us that there are heavenly hosts, and there are all different types of heavenly hosts. There's different categories of angels. Now, In Hebrews chapter 12, we won't have time to read it because it's a long passage, but the Scripture tells us that there are many different types of angels and that there are a multitude of angels and there are so many, so many, that you can't number them. The Bible tells us also that when Satan was cast down, that the kings of the earth, now follow me on this, the kings of the earth, when Lucifer was cast down, the kings of the earth sneered at him and said, is this the one who scared us? Is this the guy? The Bible tells us God spoke to Lucifer and he said, I'm casting you down because of your inequity in your commerce and in your trading. In other words, he was a thief. He didn't trade fairly. He did a lot of things wrong, but the ultimate thing he did wrong was he decided he was going to put his throne on the sides of the north. And on the sides of the north is where God's throne is. And he said, I will be like God. Somebody may say, well, what's wrong with being like God? God wants us to be like him. Ephesians 5.1 says, imitate me. In the same way children imitate their parents, you guys imitate me. That's right. He's saying that to his church. He's saying that to mankind who was created in his likeness and in his image so that they would receive him and become his sons and daughters. That's our place. That's the lane we're supposed to be walking in. That's, that's our running lane. You're not supposed to change lanes with God. When God creates you and puts you in a lane, you stay in the lane you're placed in. Angels were placed in a different lane. They were created for a different purpose. They weren't created to be like God. They weren't created to be gods. They weren't created to rule. They were created for two purposes. The Bible tells us they were created to worship God, and they were created to do things for man that man couldn't do for himself. How do they do that? Once again, Psalm 103.20, when we speak the word, they do what we can't do. Remember when Peter was in prison? Everybody was praying that he would get out of prison. An angel showed up in the prison and kicked him in the side. Now, that was wonderful. You ever been kicked by an angel? So an angel kicked him in the side. And, and the angel caused the chains to drop off and the shackles to drop off. An angel blinded the eyes of the guards so they could go out. An angel opened the iron door. Why did the angel do all of that? He did that for Peter because Peter could not do that for himself. But the angel didn't put on Peter's shoes on him and put his coat on. No, the angel said, get up, get dressed, put on your shoes. Well, why did the angel tell him to do that? Because he could do that. See, you've got to understand, the angels are not going to do for you what God has empowered you to do. They're only going to do for you what you can't do, and that's only going to happen if you speak God's word. Wow. So, Lucifer was cast out of heaven, and Lucifer 
I just wish I had more time. Lucifer was an angel, and he became Satan, and Jesus called him a devil, and devils are called evil spirits, and evil spirits are what were cast out of the people who were demon-possessed. So, my conclusion is fallen angels are demonic spirits. There's a lot of other theories out there. That's fine. Whether you agree or disagree, it doesn't affect your salvation. If you agree with me, fine. If you don't agree with me, fine. It doesn't matter as far as you being saved. That's what matters. But it helps if you understand that you have been given authority over all the power of the enemy. You know, Jesus said, he said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Well, once again, if light travels at 186,000 miles per second or 299 million meters per second, that's fast. And uh, as I've shared with you before, there's a place down here, there's one in the United States out west, and there's one in Mexico where there's craters that you can't even see these craters unless you're looking from a, an airplane at 30,000 feet or, or from the satellite, but there's craters that are miles across, miles across. And when they try to find the meteorite or whatever it was that caused that, creator, that crater, sometimes it's only the size of like a bowling ball or something. And you think, how could something the size of a bowling ball make a crater miles across? Well, the answer is this. It has nothing to do with the size of the meteor because a meteor could weigh 22 tons, but if it just lightly came down to the earth, nothing would happen. It's not, it's not the weight. It's the speed. It's the velocity. So when Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning, lightning, 299 million meters per second, when I believe when Lucifer hit the earth, it created a shift, and that's part of the shift that caused the ice age. Oh, don't get me going here. And that's, that's why when, when you fly, how many of you have a pilot's license? Okay. When you fly, there's a difference between true north and magnetic north because the earth is off of its axis. And if you ask a scientist, why is the church off? Why is the church off its axis? <laughs> the church is a little off its axis. Why, why is the earth? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Why, why is the world off? Why is it off of its axis? Science will tell you that it's because at some point in time, something hit the earth and knocked it a couple degrees off of its axis. Well, when you take Lucifer and all of his angels were cast down to the earth like lightning, that'll do it. Wow. Ezekiel, I'll give you a hint. Ezekiel 28, you need to read that. It says, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence. And therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, O covering cherub, cast him to the earth. Well, Trading with who? Commerce with who? Well, this would explain a lot of things. You know, in the Mediterranean, the uh, National Geographic did a, an article on this. There are 16 cities between Malta and Tel Aviv, Israel, in the Mediterranean, underground, underwater. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you at some point in time, the Mediterranean didn't have water in it. And then something happened and it became like New Orleans and the dike broke and it flooded, <laughs> whatever, I don't know. But see, during the time of Jesus, the Mediterranean was there. It was called the Great Sea. So, these demonic spirits are on the earth now. We, you need to understand 
that they haven't gone anywhere. And while the, the spirits of the angel, the angelic beings that are spirits, are doing everything they can to help us, the demonic spirits are doing everything to hurt us. They, they hate what God loves. And God loved you so much he sent his only begotten son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God loved us that much. And as much as God loves us, the evil one hates us. But we've been given authority over the evil one and all of his fellow devils. Once again, somebody may say, well, it says in, in Jude and Peter talks about it how uh, the angels that sinned at the time of Noah are, are bound for pits of darkness. Yeah, but that was just a couple hundred of them. There are literally millions of other demonic spirits. Think of it this way. The same 2,000 demons that were in the pigs are still here today. Where are they? I don't know. Washington, D.C.? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 don't, <laughs> I don't know for sure where they are. <laughs> but, I, but I do know this. We have authority over them. And we need to remember that we have authority. Uh, I get into this in greater detail in the book, The Paradise of God. And uh, I don't know if you like to read or not, but, but if you do, we get into more detail on this. However, I am planning on continuing this so that I can actually get to maybe like page two of my notes. And, uh, because we need to know who the enemy is. But we don't want to give any honor to the enemy. You don't want to spend so much time studying the enemy that you take away from your time of worshiping God and loving him. Because we have nothing to fear. Nothing. Let's stand. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that your word is true. We thank you, Father, that you have given us perfect love and perfect love casts out all fear. We love you, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen.